Critically analyzing global affairs. The Muckrakers on today's News Talk TNT. Well, well, a very warm welcome back to The Muckrakers. I'm joined by the brilliant uh, Andrew Bridgen and also James Freeman. Andrew was just telling me uh, in the break about uh, the scandal, and it is a scandal, about what happened uh, in the elections. And he was talking about his proudest moments, which we're going to revisit uh, before the end of the show. But before all of that, uh, the question is, monkeypox, is the K silent? Is it really just all about money? It's been renamed M- Mpox, uh, as in M people and various other things. Uh, Hugh de- uh, the, the WHO declaration uh, basically, they've declared MPOX an upsurge in the Democratic Republic of Congo and other African countries. And they've called it a public health emergency of international concern, a PHEIC, under the International Health Regulations of 2005. Um, there's been an emergency committee review, and it follows advice from them. Uh, they met on the 14th of August, uh, just a, a few days ago. And they reviewed the data and the, uh, assessed the latest situation. There's also been a new variant. There's always a new variant of these viruses called Clade 1B and you're going to hear a lot about that and that's contributed um, to that sort of side. As always we should point out there is no confirmed cases uh, of Clade uh, Mpox in the UK um, but there have been reported in Burundi Kenya, Rwanda and Uganda which is the first Mpox cases in these countries. Um, Sweden has also confirmed its first case of Clade 1 with the infected individual contracting it during a stay in an African country where the strain is present and And also in the last few hours, Pakistan has reported its first case uh, with the person having travelled from Saudi Arabia. Further testing is underway to confirm the specific strain. Um, The response has been quite extraordinary. Andrew, you're very vocal on this, um, as you have been on a lot of the things that affect us. Um, What's your take on it? Well, of course, we we need to be concerned because Bill Gates, who predicted the COVID-19 pandemic years in advance, he went on the record and said that he thought we'd have another pandemic by 2025. Well, 2025 is not many months away. Um, I think it's amazing that there's, there's, there's a few hundred uh, confirmed deaths with monkeypox in Africa, and we're declaring a public health emergency of international concern at the WHO, a P-H-E-I-C, which is pronounced fake, uh, Andrew. Fake a fake. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. IHA, I hate that, that acronyms. What it but is. It's good. And, and uh, well, that, that's 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 the that's that's how they do it. They it, it is a fake, and, and yet we've had hundreds of thousands of people around the world who've been um, clearly harmed or sadly passed away due to the vaccine harms, and no one wants to talk about it. But there's no money in that, uh, Andrew. There's a lot of money in these vaccines. Uh, more experimental vaccines. I mean, there's currently um, a a vaccine trial in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda for a monkeypox vaccine, which is being tested on children between the age of two and 12. Um, I fear that whatever they say, that whether the next pandemic is monkeypox or it is avian flu, which they've been trying for years, um, that um, they will say... um, that this is uh, a, a, a pandemic which is very serious for children. And if you don't take these vaccines and abide by the lockdowns, the pointless lockdowns, the masking and all the restrictions, and everything else, you're going to be putting children's health at risk. Because the last the last pandemic was all about uh, saving granny. Well, I mean, they unfortunately, they got rid of granny in hospital with midazolam and morphine or remdesivir in other parts of the world. And this one's going to be all about the children, whatever the the alleged virus is, and I think people should be very sceptical. The WHO have not done an investigation into their recommendations at the last pandemic, and I think there was a litany of disaster. So sure are they that they got everything right. So those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And if we're not careful, we're in for all the disasters that we had during the last pandemic and the economic and mental health and health mayhem that that caused. No, I, you're absolutely right. We always say that uh, the reason history repeats itself is because we don't learn those lessons from history. James? I don't know this. We haven't learned the lessons, Andrew. I don't think enough of the public have the at warnings, them. actually, because this isn't a mistake. This isn't a mistake. I mean, the whole EU treaty that's been set up, what that's actually about, it wasn't about sort of forcing people injections. I think that was a red herring. I think that's what the leading sort of analysts are saying now. What that treaty is, 
is an international framework for a whole new um, global trade in these new um, pharmaceuticals like vaccines, etc., and other uh, vaccines as well. And I think people should be really, really worried about it because you know there's many aspects to this. There is the actual the the, the pushing of the vaccines. But also, it's not coincidence that new laws are being brought in across Europe to stop us warning the public, like the Digital Services Act, like the Online Safety Bill. In France, in February this year, they've just introduced a law which prohibits using pressure, manipulation and biased info, whoever gets to decide that, to advocate abandoning proven, again, who gets to decide what the word proven means, medical treatments and protective um, medical drugs and things. So, there is, if you look at all of the signs on what's going on, I think I think it is clear we're going to see another pandemic. They've learned they've learned um, the lessons, Andrew, not the public or the warnings. They've learned the lessons from last time, and they realise that one of the things they've got to do this time is control the media much much stronger. And obviously, that's why we're seeing these new laws. I, you know, this 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 whole focus on extreme misogyny in the UK is another example of sort of attacking people for their beliefs and thoughts. This is the way everything's going. And I think, you know, I think the public should be alarmed, very, very alarmed at what's going on. But the important thing, as you say, is not to shut down debate. And uh, well, as Edward Bernays, the father of PR, he said that the best way to control people is through fear. It's the most powerful human emotion. Mm. You see all these images and so on and so forth. Uh, what's your take on that, Andrew? Well, that's been learnt. Um, the nudge department in the government was brought in by David Cameron around, I think, 2013, uh, the psychological nudge department. And what we saw was that on steroids uh, during the pandemic, the nudge department, I accused them in Parliament, of, it's now become the shove department and I don't like you shoving my people around. But but that's that's the messaging. They, the government or governments around the world also know that uh, the poor, impoverished, um ill um poorly educated scared people are far easier to control um than other people and, and that's unfortunately through measures of various governments that appears to be the direction of travel and i also think it's extremely worrying that announcement that came out of new zealand a few weeks ago uh with regarding to police measures in emergencies uh, which effectively means that the police would be able to hold you down while you were jabbed um, with a recommended vaccine in the event of an emergency such as a pandemic. But of course, our governments um, are going to, I believe, sign up to the WHO uh, pandemic treaty and the amendments to international health regulations. So they'll be able to say that when the restrictions and the mandates are placed upon us uh, at the next pandemic, that it's not them. It's an international mm. treaty. It's a worldwide pandemic and it's not them, but they will be implementing it. And in signing up to those agreements, which give away our sovereignty without our permission in a referendum, they are uh, they are neglecting their duties to protect the interests of those people who voted for them. No, you, you, you make some excellent points. And as I say, I mean, it's really important because we don't want to spread that fear. I mean, the, 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 just to put this into um, perspective, the risk in the UK is currently considered low, but there are preparations underway, including clinicians' uh, awareness, rapid testing and development of protocols for clinical care and prevention. Uh, they've also um, they've issued sort of guidelines as to what it is. Uh, MPOX, basically, you get skin rash, pus-filled lesions, fever headaches, muscle aches, back pain, low energy and swollen lymph nodes and it can be uh, uh, transmitted through contact with infected uh, individuals or animals uh, basically they, they advise you to follow nhs uh, guidelines um we talked about germany and they're going to start this pilot uh, eu vaccination pa passport on september the 1st uh, 2024 this year just a couple of weeks time under the european vaccination beyond covid19 um, uh, initiative and the program will document vaccination and integrate personal health data increasing state and institutional access to private information uh, a bit of a worry there the eu claim versus reality while the eu claims the initiative empowers citizens it seems it's an infringement on individuals freedoms and privacy james 
Yeah, this is an organization, isn't it, called EU, or, or I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's EU Vabico, which is the European Vaccination Beyond COVID-19 program. Um, yes. that's, that's the program that's launching this um, vaccination card. Um, basically, they say they're revolutionizing, re- revolutionizing vaccine management and ensuring a healthier future for all Europeans. I just, uh, I mean... I mean, at the moment, I think I'm in part kind of just rabbit in headlights because I don't know what to do. And Andrew, I'd like to get your um, view on this. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like that. And then just an astonishment that that this just seems to be being, being rolled out, this idea of everybody has to have all of these vaccinations now. And it's never the public have never asked for this. Um, and like I said, I think. With all of the things going on with the DSA, the Digital Services Act, the online safety bill, the fact that protests now is becoming much, much more difficult, certainly is in the UK. Um, I know there's a protest organised, I think, for October for the freedom movement. But it really, after what we've just seen, um, I think it becomes problematic because, you know, the police will start trouble. Um, and, and of course, of that avenue of protesting. So. I think at the moment, Andrew, where I sit on all this, I'm genuinely um, scratching my head how we go about fighting this. And also, um, Andrew, and I'm talking to Andrew Bridge in there, not Andrew. Andrew <laughs> too many Andrews, um, yeah. Is it, is it never, too late? Never yet? too many Andrews. <laughs> is, is it too late? Because I do I do fear, I, I kind of flip between um, having a priority of warning the public and trying to say we need to do something, you need to wake up to actually just just saying well do you know what it's too late now i've got to worry about my own family and think about what we do to mitigate all of this um because it does seem that they've got all of the pieces in place now um to drive this forward andrew other andrew go, go for it Bridget. Andrew. oh yeah well yeah well, the, no, 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 I, it was very good it was, it was a nice segue till all of us go in there i know that and there's a slight <laughs> delay i uh, go for it andrew what, what do you think well, I think it's not only Germany who are piloting this. It's being brought in in Portugal and Latvia, and I think some other countries as well. And, of course, Portugal is the most most vaccinated, probably about the same as Iceland, where I visited Iceland a few a few days ago. Um, and, and they're very compliant. So they've decided to, I think, bring it in in the most compliant nations in Europe first, uh, which I think is, is, for, is for a reason to, to get it in. But I mean, I mean, clearly, once once this is in position, um, then you're you're in a position where if you're not up to date with whatever vaccines um, your benevolent government decides that you need to take or the WHO, um, then you could be refused air travel, travel on public transport or access to events in the event of a pandemic being called or or even if it's not called, they would have the ability to to. Uh, to say, well, you're not playing your part, you're not doing as you're told, so therefore you have to be be punished in these by society. Um, I mean, it's got nothing to do, uh, you know, with the Helsinki Agreement or the Nuremberg Code about um, people should only take medicine uh, with informed consent and without any form of coercion. Oh, it, it is extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, it, it, and as they say, the World Economic Forum agenda, basically, uh, the initiative aligns with that, suggesting an agenda for increased surveillance and control. It's all scary stuff. Uh, 1984, we were warned about it. Um, what can we do to stop it, Andrew? Well, well, before, we will, and, we, well before, we, before we move on, I just kind of point out that this isn't just about travel. I mean, France, during the COVID period, suspended 3,000 workers from care homes, hospitals, health centres for refusing to get the shot. Um, Italy um, imposed it on all workers. It was mandatory. Lots of other countries around the world, we saw this as well. So it's it's more than just travel, because I think, you know, we, what we don't want people is to sitting at home is to think, well, you know, I just won't go on foreign holidays. It, it, it's actually much, much wider than that. Um, you know, it's about travel within your own country. It's about even the freedom to go out of your home and to go to work. That's what we're talking about here. So it is it is yeah. very worrying. 
I, I, you make a point. I mentioned Charlie Mullins, who's been on this show a, a, a few times, and uh, uh, and famously during uh, that sort of moment, it was no jab, no job, is what he said. Uh, and you challenged him, James. You you were on that, and uh, uh, we had that sort of viral clip that went out there. And what he was saying, the difficulty they had is they were so dependent on the experts to tell them what would do. And people, if they phoned up for a plumber, that's what they wanted to know: had they been jobbed, uh, had they been jabbed? Otherwise, they they wouldn't get their job. In the end, he said that nobody lost their job as a result of it um but it's going to be new uh, employees um what, what's your take just following up on that then andrew what, what about this no jab no oh, job well, as, he, as james well, says it's not was, just that, about that, travel that was that was that was ludicrous and quite honestly any employer who uh, who held that threat over employees and forced i mean indeed i i had a it was not a constituent but a, a young man from leicester who was threatened like that, got the jab, had one Pfizer, immediately had myocarditis, has never been able to work again. A man in his 30s. And, uh, mm. of course, then then the employer uh, actually said, well, you can't work anymore, so we're getting rid of you, uh, having caused the problem. I mean, there's a very good argument that that employer is liable for uh, a huge amount of compensation uh, in, in, in any sort of fair impl- uh, interpretation of, of the law. And I think there's going to be an awful lot of that Fly, flying around um but um these experts andrew i mean i, I, I think um, it was actually a conservative politician i'm trying to remember this i think it was whether it was michael gove said we had enough of experts that was over the the eu referendum they were wheeling out i mean you you can always you know if you, it's a bit like lawyers i mean if uh, <laughs> if you want two opinions just ask two lawyers and you can get a case going can't you and you can <laughs> do the same with experts you can do the same with experts, but I mean, we've got to have freedom of speech and we've got to have freedom of thought and expression. And science is always open to interpretation and challenge. And anyone who says that anything's ever settled um, in science, well, that should be a red flag that should warn people straight away that there's something going on here because that just isn't the way it works. And I've always stuck with the the uh, definition of an expert is X is a has been, Andrew, and the spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I love that. I was, uh, about you took the words right out of my mouth. It's exactly right. But we have to question. I mean, I always say that trust comes in on foot and leaves on horseback. And our trust in experts must have gone by now. And anybody wheels out, well, we're doing what the experts uh, uh, are saying. That, that that has been their defence. Well, but from a business point of view, it's, it's trivial. Yeah. The most important thing it. is finding out, finding out who's funding the experts, isn't it, nowadays? Mm. I mean, you know, 97% of experts will agree with the person who's funding them. Yeah, it, it goes back to what we were saying beforehand. I mean, follow follow the money in all of these things. And as they say, uh, in monkeypox, the K is uh, silent, as uh, as I think you suggested in one of your posts. Uh, well, it, uh, Bill, 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 Gates, Bill Gates says that he makes a 20-fold. It's the best investment he's ever made, is, is vaccines, and he makes a 20-fold return on his money on average. That's quite a return, Andrew, isn't it? You can buy a lot of influence with that. Oh, I, I, absolutely. And I, I think it's I, and what we like to do, as I say, was sort of shine, shine more light and less heat on the subject. It's, it's looking at those facts. And the biggest concern that I have and, and you and I have been on various platforms discussing this. The biggest concern I have is when you shut down debate. Because if you shut down debate, it means that you have to be able to hold people's feet to the fire and say, look, hang on, this doesn't quite make sense. Uh, we, we need to be able to ask those questions. Um, James, what's your take on that? We do need debate, don't we? And they tried to stifle that during COVID. COVID people like me, ordinary people, lots of journalists um, were actually monitored by the government. I know that because I put in a subject access request and they were monitoring and producing reports on what I was saying. God knows how many people across the UK they were doing that with. I just fear that they've, like I said, I think they've learned lessons from that and actually they're going to double down um, on this next pandemic, wherever it comes. I think Mpox is maybe just going to be um, a news this week, gone next week. But there's certainly, I think, something coming. Um, that's what they're preparing for. And, um, yeah, it's, it scares the bejesus out of me. It really does. Um, because, you know, history just tells us it's never, ever the good guys who want to limit free speech. Never. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a concerted right from the EU, the EU, sorry, the EU, the UN, the WHO, um, our own governments. At the moment, the priority seems to be trying to close down free speech. And, you know, um, the government, even though it's not warranted, um, because, look, 
you know, it's clear that there was a post that would, which was disinformation, which people kind of blame on kicking the violence off. But the government's message should be, you know, even if that had been true, that it had been a Muslim, it doesn't explain the violence. It doesn't sort of, um, you know, justify it or anything. But yet the government now is going to use this as justification for it's going to revisit the Online Safety Act. It's going to look at misinformation online. It's clear that all of these things are just being used in order to tighten up. Um, and I think they're preparing for what's coming down the road because they know it. either it's a, a pandemic or there'll be public unrest about digital ID and these kind of globalist um, policies. And, and they're preparing for that, I think. I think that's what's going on here. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, we've spoken publicly about this several times to the extent we're able to, is that it's it's a troubling shift, isn't it, towards centralised control and erosion of privacy. You justify it, that the means justify uh, the ends. 1984 was, was uh, sadly a very clear prediction. Uh, we're going to do a deeper dive into this, and we're also going to go through Andrew Bridgen's greatest hits, uh, his success as an MP, and we're getting back as an MP uh, straight after these messages. To hear a replay of this hour, go to episodes at tntradio.live.